Well, there are no perfect parents. I'm an illustration of that. Uh, but if you were blessed with good parents who tried hard and did their best, um, you can probably identify with the struggle you had, and I had, <laughs> in listening to parental advice when you were young. You know, a lot of times when we're younger, we think we know everything, or at least most stuff. We think uh, we know more about mom and dad than um, on, on a lot of issues. And um, then sometime later in life, we realize how much they really knew and uh, how we could have benefited if we had listened. Um, and that's just sort of, I guess, the cycle of life. Well, as we continue in our quest for wisdom, we're, we're opening up the book of Proverbs. And in the opening section of Proverbs, there's a lot of parental advice. And the way the wisdom sayings are, are organized and presented here in the first section, a lot of times is a father speaking to his son. But also uh, the mother is mentioned and lady wisdom uh, wisdom personified as a woman also has a big voice in this opening section. So we're talking about uh, chapters 1 through 9, basically, of the book of Proverbs, where we get a lot of this parental wisdom, father to son and sometimes mother included, and then uh, lady wisdom speaking. Um, and again, uh, the handout that we offered to you um, sort of shows the, the organization of this. Um, remember the first 24 chapters are designated as the Proverbs of Solomon. And then within those 24 chapters, uh, you have the, the introduction, the first seven verses, and then this section chapters one through nine uh, in the outline I gave you, basically titled A Father's exhortation to his sons. Um, and, and we're going to survey through that and then maybe get a little bit into the next section as well. Uh, there are two major temptations that are warned about in this opening section. Um, this isn't all that's talked about, but, but two major things in this fatherly advice to a young man um, and they are number one get rich quick schemes we might call them or uh, the danger of easy money so we'll see uh, a lot about that and then number two are sexual temptations or we might call it easy sex and there's a lot about that in these uh, in this opening section and and so we will uh, uh, note a little bit of, of each one of those as we survey through but again if you look uh, right at the beginning chapter 1 verse 8 of Proverbs you see how uh, this this is sort of couched and spoken where it says hear my son your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching. So <clears throat> even though we talk about this as uh, mostly a father to a son, you see here at the very, very beginning how the mother's voice is included and it's sort of assumed throughout. So this is parental instruction to children, uh, not just a father, although most of the time it's, from, it, it's presented as the voice of the father. Uh, but that's how it begins. Uh, Listen, son, to what your father and mother has to say. And, and then verse 9, For they, that is the words of father and mother, are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. <clears throat> and then right away in chapter 1, after that introduction, you get into this uh, first major temptation, the temptation toward easy money, or as we said, get rich quick schemes. Uh, and that's just to show you how that works. It begins in verse 10. My son, if, if sinners entice you, do not consent. 
If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. So you, so you sort of get the picture that the, that the, uh, the father, the parent is, is presenting to the young person. If people say these things to you, um, you know, let's, let's hide and, and ambush this person. Don't listen. Um, and this is a, a technique that's used throughout this section and really a good parenting technique if you think about it. If you're a, a, a parent with younger kids right now, what an excellent technique where you sort of paint a picture of a hypothetical. That is, if your friends come to you and say, let's do this, be careful or, or stay away from that. Later on, the, the father will talk to his son and say, if you see this woman who is enticing you and, and, and uh, trying to draw you in, don't, don't even go near her street, um, that kind of thing. So the parent is sort of proactively painting a, a potential picture of a, a pitfall, we might say, um, and, and warning their child against that, rather than just letting them go out and figure it all out for themselves. Uh, so it begins, you know, this, this get-rich-quick scheme where the, the young person's friends are saying, let's, let's hide behind the bushes and um, leap on this person and basically rip them off. Um, because it says, here, here are the friends again in, in, the, in the parent's hypothetical saying in verse 13, chapter 1, We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. That is, we'll, we're going to uh, beat this person up and steal, and we'll share all the proceeds. But then the, the voice of the parent comes back in in verse 15. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. And so, you know... The friends are saying to the young person, let's, let's hide and jump on this person. Let's set this trap for them. And, and the parent says, you see, son, what, what they're really doing is setting a trap for themselves. They're going to destroy their own life. And it's all based on this desire to get something that they don't deserve, to take someone else's possessions. And it's really going to steal their own life away. Um, it's really a wonderful technique, parenting technique, to, <clears throat> to teach by presenting a, a hypothetical, getting the, the young person to think in advance about a disastrous course of action and thus avoid it. Uh, I would encourage all parents to use this technique that, that's shown here in, in the Great Book of Wisdom. Uh, so that's temptation number one. Again, that is talked about in many different ways. Um, some of the, the shorter Proverbs later will speak against the idea of, of get-rich-quick um, schemes. And so this is a theme throughout the book. Uh, as we go on, just sort of surveying through this first section, chapter 2, verse 6, again, uh, remember... One of the things throughout the wisdom books that's emphasized is where does wisdom come from? And the source, once again, is underlined chapter 2, verse 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And remember, again, the, the idea of parallelism in, in this poetry. Uh, line 1, the Lord gives wisdom. What is wisdom? Line 2, it's knowledge and and understanding. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. 
A little bit later in chapter two, we get our first taste of temptation number two that we talked about. That is easy sex or, or sexual temptation. Uh, chapter two, verse 16. Again, we hear the voice of the father, the parent, saying to the young person, so you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So uh, a, a sort of a general warning against going after this uh, this wicked woman that's sort of tempting and reaching out to the son. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Uh, again, showing how, again and again, it's um, the voice of a parent to the young person. And uh, with this one, you get sort of pointed out what happens when you listen, when you listen to the Father's advice? Verse 2, length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So when you listen to a good, wise parent, uh, you live longer and you have peace and, and all these good things. And then verse 4 so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Uh, listening to wisdom uh, leads to, to these good things. And that verse, I hear an echo, uh, maybe you do too, of, of a verse in the Gospels. So you remember um, at the early chapters of the Gospel of Luke, where he's talking about the birth and uh, the, the very early years of the life of our Lord. Uh, at the end of Luke chapter 2, verse 52, remember it says of Jesus that he continued to grow in, in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. And a note, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4, you know, if you listen to your father, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Uh, maybe you never thought um, that, that Luke's wording there parallels the wisdom book as well as he, as he describes how Jesus grew. Uh, some of the famous words out of the book of Proverbs come next, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Those are verses you've probably heard or read before. And then chapter 4 opens once again with uh, the Father's voice. Hear, O sons, a Father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. And then... Uh, Chapter 5, again, just obviously leaping over quite a bit, but, but surveying through this. Chapter 5, we're going to get a, a fuller exposition of temptation number 2 that we referred to, this, this sexual temptation that's being warned against. Um, really, almost this uh, entire chapter, in fact, the entire chapter of chapter 5 is warning against this particular temptation. And then also there's a long section that spans chapter 6 and 7. So if you look over at chapter 6 verse 20 and then go clear through the end of chapter 7, which has 27 verses, that whole section there is dealing with temptation number 2, uh, easy sex or, or, or warning against this, this wayward a flirtatious woman who is coming after the sun. So there's really a lot of material here uh, about this. Um, and very colorful language, uh, very, again, 
the idea that the father is is a painting a picture of what could happen if the son doesn't listen. Uh, the temptation looks good, it sounds good, it smells good, uh, and yet it leads to death. And, and that is repeated over and over again. So just to see how this works a little bit, chapter five at the opening, my son be attentive to, to my wisdom. Verse three, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. You see, it's attractive. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. Sheol, again, being the place of the dead. Uh, she does not ponder the path of life. Her, her ways wander, and she does not know it. She doesn't even really know what she's doing. Why would you follow her? Uh, verse 8, keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. And, and verse 12, you know, be careful lest you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. The, the parent, the father even paints the, the idea, what happens if you give in to this? Later in life, you're going to look back and realize uh, how badly you messed up, how, what a huge mistake it was not to heed the advice of my father. Uh, he, he even paints uh, the picture of the words that the fallen son will speak one day, reflecting back on his life that he's destroyed. Verse 13, he says, I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. My instructors, I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Uh, it just goes on like that with uh, even more graphic language uh, in chapter five. And then the section in chapter six, a uh, similar kind of thing beginning at verse 20, my son, keep your father's commandment, forsake not your mother's teaching, bind them on your heart always, tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. You see, remember our, our words uh, as you walk through life. And, and again, the warning is, is leading to uh, the warning about this woman that's out there enticing the young man. Verse 25, do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture, capture you with her eyelashes for the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread but a married woman hunts down a precious life can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched another way of saying you're playing with fire right you're going to get burned. Verse 29, chapter 6. So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. You might remember in the law, uh, in the Ten Commandments, a different kind of Old Testament literature, you see. Uh, you shall not commit adultery, right? That simple, clear statement of law. Uh, we link it with a wisdom text like this, which really paints the picture of what that looks like, violating uh, the commandment, and um, makes it much more memorable, perhaps. Yeah, it's just a very powerful language. It continues like this in, in chapter 7. Um, my son, keep my words, treasure up my commandments, Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Uh, these will keep you from the forbidden woman, verse 5, and from the adulteress with her smooth words. And then uh, verse 6. I, I like this section because I, it, you can hear a good father or mother say something like this. It says, 
For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She's loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. There's temptation, you see, around every corner. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face, she speaks to him, and it goes on and, and, and uh, describes the kind of things she says to entice him, uh, all the great things she has waiting for him in her lair, you know, and uh, the way she seduces. Verse 21, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. So she has now succeeded in getting him to come with her. And he thinks, oh, this is going to be great. But notice how the language suddenly changes. Verse 22, chapter 7. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces his liver. And as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. What a powerful testimony that the father gives the son about what could happen if he turns aside and gives in to this temptation. So um, you have, again, these two major temptations that are addressed. There's also, uh, we might say, two major women um, that, that, uh, whose, whose voices we hear throughout this first section of Proverbs. Again, Lady Wisdom, we might call her, Wisdom personified as a woman, but also Lady Folly, uh, the foolish voice. Um, Lady Wisdom, the first time we hear reference to her is back in chapter 1 and verse 20. Uh, it says, Their wisdom cries aloud in the street, in the markets she raises her voice. So you see how we, um, we, we say wisdom personified. It's uh, wisdom uh, spoken of as if it's a person, and here it's a woman. She cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city, she speaks. So you have this wise voice speaking. And then also, uh, long section, chapter 8 and 9, is the voice of, of Lady Wisdom speaking. And you can sort of look at that and see the kinds of things that she says. Uh, Chapter 8, verse 1 through chapter 9, verse 12. And then there's a little section closing chapter 9, basically verses 13 through 18, that the other voice is heard, uh, Lady Folly, uh, that is, Lady Fool. Uh, that begins in, in chapter 9, verse 13. The woman, Folly, is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. She says, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he who does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Um, you have uh, the two the two voices, uh, Lady Wisdom 
Lady Folly that speak. And both of them are crying out for attention, you see. The question is, who will the young person listen to? Pretty fascinating language. Uh, there's one other little text in this opening nine chapters that I did want to point out. Uh, in chapter six, and just a different kind of saying, uh, in chapter six, beginning at verse 16, we've got a, a numerical saying. Um, let's see what we mean by that. Chapter six, verse 16 says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. And then, uh, you have the list of things that the Lord hates, beginning in verse 17. Haughty eyes, proud eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Seven things that the Lord hates that are an abomination to him. Um, and they're listed here in these four verses. That's what we call a, a numerical saying where, where it says something like, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven uh, that are an abomination to him. Okay, so that's the, the, uh, the first section of Proverbs. Uh, basically, this parental advice section a warning against these two major temptations along with a lot of other sayings uh, throughout. There's over 250 Proverbs in that section alone. And then we get into the next major section, which runs from chapter 10, verse 1, through chapter 22, verse 16. And this is really the, um, the, the what we normally think of as Proverbs throughout this section. Brief observations about life. Uh, true proverb-like sayings, and in most cases, in this long section, uh, you know, it's just one proverb after another, and they're not necessarily related to the one before them or after them. Uh, unlike in the section we just looked at where there was themes uh, throughout longer sections, here it's just one after the other sort of rapid-fire wisdom statements um, that are self-contained units, we might say. Uh, now, it, it begins, the section begins sort of uh, reflecting back on the previous one. So chapter 10, verse 1, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. So that sort of reminds us of what we just had in the first nine chapters, and it kicks off this section where most of them are on a different topic with each verse. And uh, the, again, these are designed to be very brief, very memorable sayings, uh, designed to be memorized in an oral culture uh, where you didn't have a book necessarily to 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 uh, store these up, but but you hear them and you you commit them to memory. Uh, and really, they're more brief than they even appear to us as we read them in our English translation. I just wanted to show you an example of this, uh, chapter ten again, is the beginning of this section, and verses 15 and 16, just to show you how uh, they look short in English, but they're even shorter in the original tongue. So 10 verse 15, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. So again, the, those aren't long. But if you were just to do a word-for-word -word literal translation from the original Hebrew, uh, this is what it would sound like. Rich man's wealth, strong city. Poverty of poor, ruin. Wage of righteous life, gain of wicked sin. Notice how it leaves out all the, the words that we add for it to make sense to us in English. Um, so again, it's just very, it's supposed to be very short, brief, to the point, and memorable. And that's the way all these are throughout this. And uh, 
the way I'm going to approach this this longer section, and we won't get through through all of this now, but I just want to survey through some some favorites, and I guess you'd say they're personal favorites. So if you were doing this, uh, you might well select other ones. Some of these are well known, uh, some of them not as well, but they're just very striking to me, and uh, I encourage you to to read all these and and find those that really make an impression on you. Chapter 10, verse 26, um, says this. And uh, what I like about this is just the power of the image that's, that's painted. It says, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. So remember who the sluggard is. As we talked about before, the sluggard is the lazy person, the person that cannot be relied upon. Uh, he's foolish, you know, that kind of thing. And the statement is, you know, would you really send a sluggard uh, to do something important or to take some important message somewhere? What happens? What's it like when you send a sluggard to do something important? Well, uh, the proverb says, it's like vinegar to the teeth. You can sort of feel that, can't you? And even more so to me, smoke to the eyes. Uh, you know what it's like to be around a fire and the wind changes directions and all that smoke comes in and burns your eyes. Well, that's what it's like to rely upon an unreliable person, to send a sluggard with something important. And just to me, that, that sort of shows us the power of a proverb. Uh, an illustration. Uh, remember that the word proverb and parable are, are very close. And this is the kind of thing Jesus did in the New Testament in sort of expanded form. So he really taught in proverbs, but he made the proverb a story, a picture that was relatable and very powerful. And uh, here it's just done in, in shorthand, we might say, in just a few words. Uh, the next one's chapter 11, verse 22. Again, just the power of the image here. Uh, it says, like a gold ring in a pig's snout. So think about that. You got a beautiful piece of jewelry in a, in a pig's nose, all right? What's that like? Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. So a, a woman that has no w wisdom, she may have physical beauty, but if she has no sense, if she has no discretion, if she has no wisdom about her, it's a waste. Uh, like a gold ring in a pig's snout. That is a, a memorable, memorable image. A little bit later in that chapter, chapter 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. That's a, a favorite verse of uh, evangelists from, from the book of Proverbs. He who captures souls is wise. Uh, skip a chapter over to chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 11. Here again, Remember temptation number one that was talked about in the first section, the, uh, the get-rich-quick scheme idea. Chapter 13, verse 11 says, Waith, excuse me, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gain, gathers little by little will increase it. You hear the teaching against get-rich-quick. Um, the general statement of truth, that is wealth gained hastily, or some will even translate that by fraud, okay, or dishonestly. But it may just be the, the idea of, you know, uh, not just ill-gotten gain, but, but uh, wealth that, that you get very quickly. It will disappear. It will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Uh, we wouldn't have to think very hard about examples of this, would we? Uh, 
stories we've heard through the years of people who have won huge amounts of money in the lottery, uh, went from poverty to great wealth suddenly, and then lost it somehow, or even, even uh, great celebrities or athletes who got very wealthy um, very quickly and then just squandered it all, uh, as opposed to the person who little by little saves, invests, whatever it might be, and increases over time. Uh, that is the wise way to go. And does that mean a person who suddenly gains wealth 100% of the time will lose it? No. But remember, we're, the nature of the Proverbs are uh, general statements of truth. This is generally true that wealth gained hastily dwindles. Uh, wealth without wisdom in general uh, dwindles. Chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, to a man, but its end is the way to death. Pretty famous proverb. You may have heard that quoted uh, in various contexts. And then another well-known one in chapter 14. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. How fitting that often is as we consider our day and age. Chapter 15, verse 1. Wow, don't we need this wisdom? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Uh, just the way we use, the way we speak our words, not just the words themselves, but the way we speak them can affect how things turn out in a conversation. Chapter 15, verse 17. And this is one of my favorites. I've, I've got one of my favorite sermons that I developed from, from this proverb. Um, it says, it's one of those that says, this is better than that. So verse 17 says, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. So again, the picture is of a dinner uh, people around a table, all right, and uh, the one the, the one table doesn't have much on it except uh, vegetables, herbs. Okay, hmm. might not seem very attractive <clears throat> unless you're a, a vegetarian. Uh, we meat eaters might not be much attracted to that table, uh, but at that table spread with, with vegetables, there's love. The people around the table love one another. That's better than a table spread with a lot of meat, a fattened ox, but everybody around the table is angry at one another and hates one another. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. And certainly we can understand that and the power of that truth. Chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pretty well known. I'm trying to, <clears throat> to uh, underline some of these that, that uh, we may have heard quite a bit, but maybe don't remember where they're from. Uh, 16, 18 is a big one. Uh, another one with a great picture is verse 24 of that same chapter. 1624 of Proverbs, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Gracious words um, are sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Just uh, in praise of good, gracious words. Verse 31, gray hair is a crown of glory it is gained in a righteous life. So there's a lot of praise in, in Proverbs and in the wisdom literature for the aged and, and this idea that, that uh, age is something to be respected and, and um, uplifted. Gray hair is a crown of glory. Now, 
let's face it, that that, that is that idea has fallen on hard times in Western culture where we're all trying to stay young. And we would say almost the opposite, that youth is the glorious time. And yet scripture almost always praises wisdom gained in a long righteous life. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Chapter 16, verse 31. And then uh, two verses later, again, this one not related to the previous one, uh, but that's just sort of how this section is. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Now, we might be puzzled a little bit about what that's talking about. The lot is cast into the lap, the lap but it's every decision is from the Lord. Uh, it's something uh, in the ancient world, in biblical times, um, casting of lots was, was a way of making decisions. And when you had to choose, um, you know, do I buy the Ford or the Chevy? Well, they weren't asking that question, but uh, two equally good uh, choices, unless you're a Ford man or a Chevy man, but you don't know which way to go. And so how do you make that choice? You cast lots. Now, the casting of lots may have been in several dis different forms. Uh, it may have been you, you have a, a white stone and a black stone, and the white represents the one choice and the black the other, and, and you pull it out of a bag or you cast it on the table, whatever it might be. Whichever one comes up, that helps you make your choice. Or it may have been something like our drawing the straws along, who gets the short straw, that kind of thing. Uh, we don't know exactly what form casting of lots took, uh, but it was some kind of random choice mechanism. But, but notice uh, the way they thought about the casting of lots. Um, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So who is making the choice uh, to a person of faith in, in Scripture? God was the one controlling which stone was chosen or which straw was chosen. It's God's decision. This is our way of divining what God wants us to do in this situation. Uh, that may seem quaint or even... Uh, a little questionable to us, that practice. But we might keep in mind that even in the New Testament church, in the earliest church, they did this. For instance, when um, Judas, one of the original 12 apostles, um, when he takes his own life and they have to replace him in the early chapters of Acts, and it comes down to a choice between two people, they cast lots. And obviously, it wasn't just a random act, but they were uh, trusting that choice to God. And so this, this proverb reflects that ancient practice. Now, it might be an entirely other discussion to, to ask, is that still a valid way of making choices? Uh, so something to think about. Chapter 17, just a couple more of these, and then we'll close out uh, this session. A couple, a couple Proverbs here in chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 9, it says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Uh, that's a, such a wise piece of, of reflection there. Um, You don't have to tell everything you know, is another way of saying this. And you ever run into a person who, who thinks they have to tell everything that they've heard or that they know? The wise person realizes not everything has to be repeated, even if it's true, you see. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Repeating something might do 
much more damage to relationships. Uh, and, and you have to have discerning wisdom to, to figure that out. The next one, uh, the very next verse, verse 10, a rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding. And remember, understanding is in parallel with wisdom. So a rebuke, you rebuke a wise person. That goes deeper into him than a hundred blows into a fool. So you can do more with a, a wise rebuke to, to a person who has some sense, some understanding, than just beating the fire out of a foolish person. They don't ever learn. You see, the fool never learns no matter what you do, but a wise person listens to a rebuke that is, that is well-intended and wise. Just a sort of a neat statement of truth there. Verse 12 is another one of those that's just it's so um, picturesque um, that, that it strikes me. It says, let a man meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs. Now think of that, hunters. Um, you go out and you run across, or you are the one who steals the, the little ones of the bear and the bear finds out, the mama bear finds out. Uh, you, you, you don't have to have described to you what's gonna happen. Let a man meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. What's more dangerous, running into an angry mother bear or a fool who's acting foolishly? Well, the, the, the wisdom, the wise person here, the speaker, says it's more dangerous um, to, to meet a fool in his folly. You might lose your life to the mother bear you might lose your soul to the fool. Pretty powerful language. And then the last one in chapter 17, and then next time we'll, we'll come back and we'll continue sort of surveying through these random ones. But I love uh, chapter 17, verse 28, where it says, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. There is a, a, a theme in the Proverbs uh, to be careful about your words. And in fact, the less words you speak, uh, the better. Uh, some of us preachers and teachers could take that advice. Uh, but you see what, what it says, even if you're foolish, if you keep your mouth closed, People might not know it. Uh, you might be thought intelligent if you, you keep your mouth closed. Uh, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Uh, that is said in several different ways throughout the Proverbs. We might note a couple others of those, um, but it states an important truth of life. Well, I hope you'll um, be reading through the Proverbs and benefiting from them uh, beyond even our sessions here. I thank you for, for checking this out, tuning in, taking the time to study uh, with us. There are such great riches in the book of Proverbs for, for daily living. I hope you're seeing that. Have a great day and a great rest of your week. And we hope to see you on the Lord's Day coming up. God bless.